and one. Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Dan Cartolicchio, and welcome to the Suburban Wellness Group Podcast. We are very fortunate today. We have Dr. Divya Kakaya here with us. She is a PhD in, in psychology. Dr. K, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm, ex I'm excited about this. This is, this is going to be great. Now, what I want to do first is I want to read Dr. K's bio because it's phenomenal. She's been practicing in San Diego since 1985. Have you always been in San Diego? Did you? Unfortunately, I live in a horrible city over here. I've been here for 41 years. <laughs> <laughs> but the weather is warm though, right? The weather is deliciously warm. Actually, it's drizzling a little bit right now, which is like bizarre for us. In, in June, but it's called the June gloom is what we call it. We have call a it the June gloom. Okay. So Dr. K has been in San Diego since 1985, extensive experience, and she is one of the foremost leaders in the field of brain training, postdoctoral degree, master of science in psychopharmacology, which prepares her to be an integrative psychologist. I love that. Dr. K's Brain Wellness Center incorporates treatment modalities that are on the cutting edge of brain, neurocircuitry, and biochemistry, utilizing biofeedback, bio neurofeedback, treatment for the last 11 years with tremendous success. Mm -hmm. She works with uh, specialist naturopathic doctors, chiropractors, pharmaco pharmacogenetics, acupuncturists, psychiatrists, getting great results, looking also, and I love this, the gut-brain connection especially its important role that nutrition plays in it. Also successfully treating brain injuries, depression, anxiety, loss, loss of focus, concentration, ADD, ADHD, learning disorders, OCD, Tourette's, seizures, fibromyalgia, and spectrum conditions such as autism and Asperger's using neurofeedback. Dr. K., Thank you for being with us. That is one fabulous bio. How did you get interested in the brain? That's what I wanted to ask you first. How did you get interested in the brain? Good question. Well, you know, as a psychologist, you're always kind of working with the mind. Right. right. Because you're working with thoughts and you're working with feelings and you have a lot of that going on. And I think that for me, um, I've always been like a researcher, so I'm always mm -hmm. looking at biological processes. And in my past life, I treated um, eating disorders. I call it my past life because I was in that world for a very long time. Right, right. And, and with medical conditions like those, you always needed to be looking at biological processes that are going on because now we know for sure that there's a strong biological drive with eating disorders as well. So it's in the genes, it's, there's a biological component. Correct. So I, was, I always wanted to keep myself kind of like ahead of the game in terms of understanding biochemistry, understanding the body, understanding the brain. And of course, my entry into the brain occurred because I have this amazing young man who happens to be my son, mm -hmm. who I knew as I was working with him in, in elementary school and middle school, that there were going to be some challenges with that brain because of an inattentive component to his brain. So I knew that. And so it was kind of very synchronous that around the time that I was completing my postdoctoral degree, which taught me all of my current knowledge I have about the brain, right. it was around that time is when he was in his sixth grade and we were having some of these struggles with homework. And I happened to run into a colleague who treats uh, using neurofeedback and I was off and running with that. Yeah. You just went off and running with it. Yeah. You know, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that um, I have a background in functional neurology and yeah. my son, in addition to, has this inattentive uh, yeah. way about him doing homework. And it's very difficult to do homework right now with him being home because school was canceled because of COVID. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of give and take and, it, and it's very difficult at times to get them 
to sit down and to do their homework. Eventually we did the testing and he had a mixed mild ADHD yes. type of a situation. And so we work with it nutritionally. We see, you know, there's a neuropsychologist and, and he's doing better. However, the issues are still, are still there. And what I'm going to love about this podcast is that we've done so many podcasts about immunity, body's immunity and COVID. And what we're going to be talking today about is post-traumatic stress disorder, emotional immunity, which you coined. I love that emotional immunity. And we're going to talk about trauma and we're going to talk about COVID and how it, and how it all relates. So from a neuroscience perspective, tell me about what happens with the brain when it goes through a traumatic situation. You know, we have COVID going on. There's a lot of things going on right now. There's a lot of trauma going on. What happens to the brain with this trauma? So, so I think one of the best ways to sort of think about uh, uh, trauma is to think of it as an event that is out of the ordinary that occurs in our life, right? Mm -hmm. We're kind of merrily going along uh, March 10th, March 11th, March 12th. We were thinking, okay, there seems to be this virus from Wuhan that's around, mm -hmm. but boom, before we know it, March 13th, a lot of my patients call it Friday the 13th, that it seems like this entire three months have been kind of like Friday the 13th, just never right. ending right? That's how people have felt. Sure. The trauma is when we have uh, something out of the ordinary that occurs that is unpredictable that sort of suddenly emerges on us, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have like, if there's a plane going overhead right now and it suddenly crashes into my neighborhood, that is definitely a traumatic event that we're going to experience. Sure. It happens in the brain because the brain is interested only in one thing, and that is its survival right? The right. brain is very committed to its survival, which is why we can be 95 years old and be very alert and be doing all the joyful things we do in life. Because what the brain wants to do is the brain wants to live and the brain wants to live a healthy, happy life. When a traumatic event occurs to the brain, what occurs is that we kind of go into one of these three responses. You fight, you run away, you flee, Mm -hmm. or you get frozen. So in the brain, as the brain is attempting to cope with this very unexpected event that comes up, the brain knows that to protect itself, either it needs to pretend like it's dead, which is the freeze, mm -hmm. or it needs to get out there and become the tiger and go fight it, mm -hmm. or it needs to run away as far as possible it can. And in terms of what it, the neurofeed, in terms of the brain electrical activity in the brain, we have three um, uh, neural networks that get affected in the brain. It's trauma. So these have been studied. We have a lot mm -hmm. of research with these neural networks. And these three are, one of, one of them is the default mode network. Mm -hmm. Then we have the salience network. And then we have the central executive network. So the default mode network is kind of like in the frontal area of the brain. So basically, you know, we have what I, I always talk about the brain in terms of like our primitive brain, which is mm -hmm. your, uh, your, um, the part of the brain that wants to protect itself and get itself out of danger. Right. So that primitive brain, brain comes online. And then in a case of the trauma, your, our executive functioning, the part of us that can say, well, it's okay. Who take a deep breath. It's okay. This can change things around. We can do this. We can do that. That's what I call the upstairs brain. And some of those default mode networks are there. So the brain is directly impacted by trauma in terms of what happens in the electrical uh, networks in the brain. Right. So you were talking about how the brain gets frozen and how it fights. Is there a way to determine which individual may fight or which individual may get frozen? Um, because in life, you know, you have those that can overcome a little bit more, those that are a little bit more resilient, if you will. And is there a way to determine when you're dealing with a patient, can you tell? And, 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 and how would it be, how would you treat them differently if one was more of a, you know, fight or one's more frozen? I think, so 
So what we know from research is that out of a, a group of 100 people that have experienced the same traumatic event, 20% mm -hmm. of those folks will develop PTSD and 80% will not. So out of all of us say if that happens in Touchwood in this neighborhood, um, there would be 20% of us that would experience that. Now, what we've, we know is that uh, our early years in our life, our early attachment mm -hmm. uh, relationships make a very big difference in our experience of trauma. Interesting. And so when we're being raised in the families that we're being raised in, if we have attachment with parents or with caretakers, where the attachment with them is a stable attachment, what we call a secure attachment, then those people are able to have that resiliency and they don't necessarily need to jump into one of these three modes of functioning. What they may do is they're able to bring in their uh, executive functioning part of their brain and they're mm -hmm. able to try to make sense of it. Because in those earlier years, if things were rocky and something happened, if there was a parent that was there listening to your feelings and your thoughts about it, right. then you knew that you were gonna be taken care of. So that child, that inner child, you know, in psychology, we often talk about the older, the adult you taking care of the, that inner child in you, right? Right, so right. If that child has been traumatized in some way in their earlier years, they're more likely to be at risk for developing uh, complicated reactions from the trauma. So, so if you had if you had that unstable uh, relationships growing up, it would be you know that that would lead to an individual having more of the post traumatic stress um, that's going on. How does that relate to COVID? How does that relate to COVID? You know, you know, you, you heard all about this, and all of a sudden we have COVID. We're in. You know, you know, you can get a lot of anxiety when it comes to this, right? You know, yeah. I'm sure you're seeing patients. So, how does that? How does this relate to COVID? So the way it relates to COVID, I think the classic way, and I knew, and, and, and you know, when you and I were talking last week, one of the things that we know is that because of how abruptly the stay-at-home orders came on us, right. there was a lot of like, oh, everybody like shut down. There was, it was almost commanded to us to right. freeze freeze so the way it relates to COVID is we were told because we wanted to be good citizens and we wanted to follow and we wanted to we wanted to bring down that curve we will do anything we were told because there was so much fear about death right so much fear about dying from this disease and this right. disease seemed like and when they were showing us pictures and so all of that media consumption we did as COVID kind of came on Right. That in itself actually enhanced the fear we already felt about what was going on and why we needed to be good citizens and follow the guidelines. So I think the way it relates to COVID is I believe that COVID is one of those experiences that, as I mentioned, trauma. It's a trauma experience. Right. One of those experiences that's out of the ordinary. When have we ever, when have we ever right. hunkered down for three long months? No, we haven't. I, as I, I do remember in the 1970s here in New Jersey, we were going through, I think it was the swine flu and our schools and some, you know, we, we, we were, we were told, you know, we, you know, go home quarantine for one week, but we didn't listen. We were young. Yeah. Our immune systems were strong and, and, and we went out and it was interesting that you, that you um, mentioned the media, and I'm not going to bash the media, but you listen to the media, and it's very stressful, very stressful. As a matter of fact, my wife at one point in time, I said to her, honey, stop listening. Stop. You have to stop listening because every day you're hearing about so many different aspects yes. of this, right. and, and the media can have a very powerful you know, uh, impact on your psychological well-being. And on the brain. I mean, I think the media, and if you look at the screen, the way the screen is, and, you know, they would have all the numbers on the side, and there were these banners right. at the bottom, all in red. 
there's a lot of red that gets used and then you saw the image of the coronavirus and right. all of that was a way in which we were just hijacked into more and more and more fear. And, right. and I think that fear is a very powerful motivator that can be used to move people into like all kinds of directions as we know, right? right. So I think that part of what, so as so some of what I was urging people to do through the onset of COVID is reduce your consumption of media. Uh, that was my next question. Were, yeah. you know, were, you, were you telling your, your, your patients, stop, yeah. stop? And I think even now with all the, all the peaceful protests that are happening, what media will be doing is they're going to be showing us the violence in those pre peaceful protests. Because right. we want across the country with all the protests that are going on, that media only wants things that will sensationalize it and bring fear and then get us hooked to it. Because media knows really well that we get hooked by fear. Right, and so the fear can bring out the best and can bring out the worst. And now what happens is we have two situations that are happening one after the other. And so now there's even more anxiety because you're, and you're seeing on, like you said, on the screen, because it's here also in the Northeast where you're looking at the screen and, and you see number of new cases, number of, of deaths. We never saw the number of individuals right. who recovered, which again, not that, you and I, and we're not going to tell our patients to run out into society and, and you're going to go to the movie theater tomorrow, right? You're, we, we're, we're not going to recommend that. However, you know, you know, you would look at that and you would say, I have a chance to survive because 99.8, whatever it was, seven, eight, three percent was going to survive this. Yes. And so, you know, you don't have that anxiety. Now you have the turmoil that's going on right now and you're only seeing, you know, the, 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 the violent aspect of it instead of the peaceful aspect where people are standing shoulder to shoulder and, and they're, and and they're holding saying, each other. Holding right. Each other. And also the whole, I think the, I think one of the biggest reasons why so many people, well, I think, I think what happened with COVID, and this is emotional immunity too, is what happened with COVID is COVID made, COVID equalized all of us. It didn't matter what SES group you came from. It didn't matter what your background was. Right. If a virus was going to come to you, it was going to come to you. It was coming in all communities. It's and not so specific for one individual or anything. If it's, if it's oh. coming, it's coming. Yeah, exactly. And then so it, since it became such a level leveling field for all of us, and remember the hashtag through most of the last three months has been hashtag we're all in this together. Right. Okay? So our brains again got programmed for the last three months to be thinking we're all in this together. So what happens when we have Mr. Floyd who gets killed? <laughs> I, I call it lynched because of mm -hmm. it was on the neck and mm -hmm. it was like, you might as well have put a rope around his neck. Right. So, and everybody's glued to the televisions. So people actually saw that image of those eight, eight minutes and 46 seconds. Yes. So again, the emotional brain got, got impacted. Right. And we've got this pre thing that's going on, which is we're all in this together. And so, and people had been cloistered for three months so i think the freedom that everybody's feeling in taking power back from covid and taking power back from racism i think that's one of the reasons why we have so many people of so many different colors that are out on the streets right now right right now you mentioned emotional immunity and yeah. you and i were talking about that tell me what is the definition or how would you describe this emotional immunity emotional immunity you know obviously as a chiropractor you talk about like physiological immunity that sure. you can create and i think about emotional immunity as ways in which we create resiliency our ability to bounce back the way in which we can have adverse situations occur to us and the strength we create as we as our psyches bounce back from traumatic events Okay? So emotional immunity, think about it as the way in which your mind and your brain are able to bounce back from 
out of the ordinary events that occur to us. And right. some could be traumatic and some could just be out of the ordinary events. Sure. So you know, that's, that's that strength that we have, uh, the strength we have in ourselves. So, so now that I'm thinking about it, we're, we're, we're discussing this emotional immunity. How would you strengthen it? How would you build up this emotional immunity? I think, I think, that, I think that our listeners are going to sit there and say, all right, we have this emotional immunity, but how do we work on that and how do we make it better for us? Such an important point. I think there's so much we can do. I think there's so much we can do to, to get em to get emotionally immune and of course as a psychologist one of the first places i'm going to go to is your feeling states mm -hmm. right so we've got to be able to talk about our feelings we have got to be able to talk about not just the good sets of feelings we've got to be able to talk about the whole range of feelings right mm -hmm. we've got to be able to be emotionally vulnerable we've got to be able to uh really ally our social systems one of the biggest ways in which we build emotional immunity is by harnessing our, our social systems around us right mm -hmm. so traumatic events are going to occur to all of us at different points in our life but what we do with it is what matters in terms of whether you're building emotional right. immunity or not. does right. that make sense right 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 you know what happens it's it, from, from what i'm gathering is that if there's something positive that comes out of this right. something good comes out of it you're going to build emotional immunity and each situation that you have in life will help you build this yeah. emotional uh, uh immunity, immunity. And, and when you're expressing your feelings you always feel better you right? do you do i mean I, I remember my grandmother you know in her latter stages of life she would just cry over nothing and she says oh i feel better now <laughs> There you go. And we all feel better. I mean, God has given us these beautiful tear ducts for a reason. And when we right. cleanse, when those tears come out, we're like cleansing. And we've got to be able to allow ourselves to be able to see that there's there's a real and, and I think the big the big emotional part that we need to be able to do is we have to be able to grieve. We right. need to grieve. We lost a lot. Why, why is that important to grieve? What is grieving and why is that important? Well, I think the reason, the reason why grieving is important is because anytime we have lost anything, we've got to be, our, our country tends to be this like, okay, let's move on. Okay, mm -hmm. done, funeral's done, let's move on. Mm -hmm. If we look at a lot of other cultures, in a lot of other cultures, there are grieving rituals that go on for like a month and a half that then you have something else at three months and you have something else at six months and you have a year. So there are lots of grieving rituals. We tend to shy away from grief and we tend to want to put on our, you know, bootstraps and get right back on, on mm -hmm. the horse again, kind of a thing. But the reason why grieving is important is because we have lost something very, very emotionally significant to us. And what we lost through COVID what we've lost through COVID, and I'll talk about what we lost through, through racism, what we've lost through COVID is our sense of safety, like our core sense of safety. And that's, and that's important safety because everybody wants to feel safe in their homes, in their community, in society. You wanna be able to go out, even if you're just going to go for a walk with the dogs, with the family around yes. the block. You know, they don't want to have to look, you know, around and say, what's going on? Is there a virus? Is, you know, anything. It could be, it could be anything. So grieving is important because we lost a lot. Think mm -hmm. about all of our children. My son lost his college graduation. He lost his last semester at college when they were looking forward to, you know, doing so many things. Right. We lost, like high schoolers lost their prom, they lost their mm -hmm. dances, they lost all these rituals. We, we, as a society, when we go from event to event to event, we have certain rituals that marks the beginning and the end of one event and the next event. Right. So, so grieving is important because we did lose a lot. And once we grieve, 
as we're able to grieve, then what happens very organically, because our brain wants to be happy and the brain wants to be healthy, right? So then when we allow ourselves to grieve, what occurs is then automatically we're able to come up with these resilient solutions to what do I do next? What do I do next? How can I feel sad and do the next too? And I think that's important because you come up with a positive solution Absolutely. to a situation that is, is occurring. And that builds your executive functions yes. so that the next time you go through something that's traumatic, you can deal with this better. And I can tell you that my son, he lost his, he lost his friends. Not that he lost them he physically. Lost, he lost them emotionally. He lost them emotionally. And for him being 12 years old, Dr. K, it was huge. Because I remember coming home on a Friday afternoon and he was on the couch crying. And here's this big 12-year-old kid who's a hockey player, you know, you know, he's, and he's muscular. And he's like, I want to be with my friends. I miss them, you know, going down the block and, and just getting on the bike and riding with his friends. And as society is being opened up more, <clears throat> he's spending more time with his friends. And it all started not too long ago, you know, with one of those drive-by birthday parties, you wave yeah. Yeah. and we were waiting in line. And the next thing you knew it, all these kids were running around and it was like they haven't seen each other dr k for years we not that we lost them are so important for all of us right and not that we not that we lost them but they were gone for hours and you know we were like you know we're tired we want to go home it's five o'clock you know where you know where are the kids they didn't come back for such a long but they were having such a good time and the other point I want to bring up, I understand what you're saying about the grieving process. Yeah. You know, it, it's, 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 it's important to grieve because I, my father passed away when he was 71. It's about nine years ago, 10 years ago. And I grew, I grew up in a very um, strong Italian American immigrant yeah. family. Yes. I, I wrote, when you were talking about grieving, the word that I wrote down was stoic. We oh, were stoic. Yeah. You know, we were, we were tough and we moved on. And I will tell you for six months mm. after my father passed mm. and my family will corroborate this is I had ear infection after ear infection oh, after sinus infection because I was stoic until I said, I have to deal with this. Good. I have to deal with it. You know, I have to take a look at this and I have to go through this process. And it took me a period of time to figure out how to go through the process because again, you know, my family, the males especially were very, we were the strong silent type. And, and you know, we got up the next day, we went to work and I still have some of that. Yeah. And, but you know, this was my father. So I had, to, I had to take a look at it. And once I was able to come to grips and yes. grieve, you know, did I feel like the weight was lifted off of my shoulder? Well, and so, so what was really happening is that repressed grief shows up in the emotional molecules of our body. Mm -hmm. okay? And so if we imagine, so you can see that, you know, suppressing that grief, uh, you know, there were so many symptoms in the body that started to emerge, right? Mm -hmm. When we look at our, the bodies of our African-American communities that have experienced trauma for 400 years on their bodies via slavery, mm -hmm. it's going to take another 11 to 20 generations of us coming out. Because what's happening in the streets right now is grieving. Mm -hmm. People are grieving the freedoms that people have lost for right centuries right? right so we know that when enough grief sort of comes through and my guess is that we'll continue to have many more peaceful riots many more peaceful demonstrations until folks feel heard and understood and validated and until we all 
that have the privilege that we have are able to create the space and stand side by side with, with our black friends. And I think as we do that, but imagine that if that amount of repression with your dad showed up as so many body, body events, we right. can see why COVID has been disproportionately affecting communities of color because right. there's so much trauma that resides in yes. the body that's not resolved trauma. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. That makes sense. I think that, <laughs> um, I think that understanding and, and the validation aspect of it is, is very important because I know that for myself, yeah. You know, um, I, I have been talking to many different types of, of groups and people because of different uh, organizations that I'm in, involved in and different things that I do in my, in my professional and, and, and personal life. And, and coming to an understanding and coming to validation on both ends because we're listening to each other on both ends. It's, yeah. it's kind of like that grieving process you know, you know, we're talking about, you know, you know, we're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and we're talking about emotional immunity and, and, and understanding and validating, you know, having that two-way communication, you feel like, oh, okay, I understand exactly what you're talking about and you understand me and we're, and we're communicating you know, what it is. And it's all good because at the end of the day, I think we all want the same thing. You know, I think we all want, we want, love, we want love and we want to feel heard. Right. We want to feel understood. And I think in terms of building emotional immunity, that is actually one of the bigger, bigger things that we do have control over. So, you know, when traumatic events occur to us, and we do little things that give us a sense of agency and a sense of control. So I was telling some of my patients, I'm like, is there one area in your room, in your house, that's just like really bothering you? Go into that area and control the heck out of that area. Because mm -hmm. when you're feeling a loss of control in so many other areas, you find something really small that you can control a lot that gives you a feeling of agency. So anything that gives us a feeling of choice and a feeling of agency tends to build emotional immunity. Right. So expressing and validating helps out with building that emotional immunity. Correct. Correct. Understood. I, I think for our, our listeners here today, I think, that, I think that is very, very important. Now, I want to go back to the brain a little bit now. We were discussing the frontal lobe and, and how that's impacted. Is there any other areas specifically of the brain that's, in, that, that's affected when you, when you have trauma? So, so the hippocampus is sort of like, you know, that, that reservoir of memory, right? right? The hippocampus is the reservoir of memory. Explain what the hippocampus does a little bit. You know, that's, you know, it's the reservoir of memory. What else does it do? So the hippocampus is actually the, the region of the brain where new neurons are born in our brain. Mm -hmm. So the hippocampus, you know, there was a study that was done with uh, a, a strong, by the way, a strong hippocampus also prevents dementia and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Dementia are strong. Right. They did a study uh, with the, the, you know, the black cab drivers in London the mm -hmm. ones who drive the black cabs. Mm -hmm. And remember the way the streets of London are, you kind of like, everything is like, it's not systematic to how it is here. It's all so over the place. <laughs> it's all over the place and you have roundabouts right. and you do all of this stuff. And so these, these cab drivers literally needed to memorize the streets of London because as they were taking people from place to place, right? What they found when they did brain MRIs of these guys, comparing it to other normal controls, that their hippocampus was incredibly dense and strong and powerful because mm -hmm. of the amount of memorization they had done. And right. that group also tended to not have Alzheimer's or dementia or anything like that. So it was like very, right. very clear that right. the more we do, so where the hippocampus comes in in terms of trauma is it's the reservoir of emotional memories as well. Mm -hmm. and when we experience a traumatic event, typically what gets embedded in there is it, the, the memory of that trauma gets embedded in there. Right. So what we want to be able to do as we do some of the therapies that we do with trauma, like, you know, we've got neurofeedback, we've got EMDR. Right, we're going to get into that. Yes, yeah, that's, we, that's all very interesting. Yes. So what happens is what we're doing with the different 
um, therapies that we use with neurofeedback is we're actually encouraging the place where those trauma memories are embedded Mm -hmm. to release themselves so that the brain can unfreeze itself and the brain can begin to do the work it needs to do to feel a little bit of safety in the world. Right, you know? right. So from one neuroscientist to another, tell me about the amygdala, the amygdala and how this plays. You're looking at me, you're like, wow, huh? You know, well, so as I said, you know, I got boards in functional neurology. How does the amygdala, because it's, it's the emotional center it's the emotional core of the brain so the, so, amygdala is the, the emotional core of the brain and it kind of sits right there in the middle in the middle of the brain right. so from the brain stem like when you have the fear five fear fear response first it goes to the amygdala because the feeling part of the brain needs to immobilize the organism it needs to tell the or organism danger 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 take care of yourself here right mm -hmm. and so the emotional core and remember, we always talk about sort of like your gut instinct, right? We say your gut instinct. Right. That's the phrase we use a lot. So right. That because your instinct, you're given an emotional clue that something feels awry over here. So when we talked about building emotional immunity by talking about your feelings, mm -hmm. part of what we're doing is we're giving the amygdala a chance to continue its healthy functioning because the amygdala picks up a lot of feelings, but it needs to have an outlet and an expression of those feelings. So we begin to feel better about our world when whatever those feelings are that we got hijacked with, we can talk mm -hmm. about those feelings. Right. So that's one of the reasons why one of the ways we build immunity, emotional immunity, is mm -hmm. you gather with people who you can talk to. And talk. So, so I'm not suggesting, for example, I'm not suggesting spend 24 seven talking about COVID or spend 24 seven talking about what's going on, on, on with the demonstrations, but right. talk about your feelings about right. what's on and that makes a huge difference for the brain in terms of if if we if we make ourselves too much of a thinking brain that's imbalance if we make ourselves too much of a feeling brain that's imbalance if we right, right? so what we want to do is right. we want to get balance in the brain you want it you want it you want to you want to you want to balance it out yeah. let's get into some treatments now you're doing uh -huh. neurofeedback uh -huh. tell me how does neurofeedback fit in to the post-traumatic stress disorder and the emotional immunity and, and, and how it helps the brain? That would be the first question. Mm -hmm. Or the first two questions are, are, you know, how does neurofeedback fit in and how does it start healing and helping the brain? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm leaning in now. I'm leaning in because yeah. I've been leaning in all, all throughout this conversation. I'm, this, is, <laughs> this is very interesting. Yeah, it is. It is. And I think what I we okay, so the number one concept we've got to understand before we even talk about neurofeedback is what I call brain plasticity. Okay. I was I was waiting for you to say that. <laughs> well, and, and, and we have to talk about brain plasticity. One hundred percent. We used to think like, and a lot of people still think like the first five years of your life are the most core important years in your teenage years. You lay down some more pet pathways, all kinds of things like that. What we know is that at any point in our life, you could have a person that's 94 years old and their brain is still capable of integrating a lot of change there. It's capable of getting better and improving and doing a lot mm -hmm. of change. So what we can do is we can make sure that we understand that whether you're 42 years old, you're 58 years old, you're 78 years old, you're 94 years old, that when given the right food to the brain, mm -hmm. the brain is very capable of rewiring, reorganizing, reestablishing new pathways for itself. The other piece that I kind of talk a little bit about, because I'm sure you've done this with the other podcasts too, is talking about, so neuroplasticity of the brain is very important. Mm -hmm. The other chemical that I like to have make sure people make friends with or know about is a chemical called BDNF. Mm -hmm. So that's your brain derived neurotropic factor. Yes. I call BDNF the fertilizer for the brain, right? Right. 
So, and, and, and some of the best ways we grow BDNF is when we do probiotics, when we eat fish, when we eat a lot of berries, you eat walnuts, you eat a lot of greens. Mm -hmm. So that gives fertilizer to the brain. So yes. our nutrition and as an integrative psychologist, one of the things I talk about when my patients come to treatment with me, I don't just talk about what we're going to be able to do with the brain. I want to be talking about lifestyle issues. I want to be talking about exercise. I want to talk about yoga. I right. want to talk about breath. So those are all very, very important, right? Right? They are they are extremely important for the neuroplasticity. This is a passion of mine. This is an absolute passion of mine. And 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 we're talking each other's languages right now. And 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 having the array of supportive nutrients yes. for that chemical soup that the brain is bathing in is extremely important to do that. Breathing is extremely important. You know, you know, I was taught how to box breathe. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and box breathing is very important. In five, hold. Out five, hold. And that was actually taught to me by special, uh, 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 special forces, special operation uh, forces, that they actually do this type of breathing. It calms the mind, yes. the monkey mind. It calms the monkey mind. It, it, it takes all of the chatter yes. away. It sets up the environment for that mm. brain plasticity to occur so yeah. that, you know, you're kind of better. You're better for it. You know, you're uh, yeah. better for it. Yes, you know? you're healthier. You're healthier. You're you're able to remain calm. You can make decisions, kind of like what I call from the upstairs brain. Right. And so, so you know, before I kind of talk about the way in which neurofeedback impacts the uh, the traumatized brain, I thought it's really important for everybody to have hope and the knowledge that no matter what kind of adverse situations we've experienced in our life of a brain when given the right nudging is very capable of uh, reorganizing itself and very powerful it. tool yeah it's a very powerful it's a very powerful tool so what i do with neurofeedback is basically it is i tell people to think about neurofeedback as physical therapy for the brain that's great i love that so because the brain is a muscle right and the muscle has been exercised in certain ways and the muscle needs to exercise in certain other ways in, in order for that muscle to be stronger, mm -hmm. healthier, more powerful and serve you better, right? So you think about, you know, when we do a certain number of sit-ups, we're building our core. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, what we're doing with neurofeedback is we place certain sensors in different regions of the brain and my, I have a few kinds of systems, but one of my systems, there's visual feedback, there's auditory feedback, and then there's tactile, there's a teddy bear on your lap. So we're using, I pick up the signals from your brain on my software, I'm adjusting things so that what I want to do is when you go into the electrical, the range of your brain that I'd like your brain to go to, the brain receives a reward because the music gets louder, the monkey buzzes more, and your your um, uh, the tunnels open up more with more expansiveness, right? Mm -hmm. So, so neurofeed to be thinking about neurofeedback as a way in which if you're working with a trainer and you just did like you know uh, a five minute plank and he's like, okay, you can do a half an hour more. So uh, half, a, half a minute more or something. Right. So what we're doing with neurofeedback is we're taking the brain to a certain place and we're, we're nudging it to remain there and we're giving it reinforcement for it to stay there. And then the brain is so smart because the brain is like, wow, I did that. But also what the brain notices is that after it has done the neurofeedback, the next day or two or three, there's a certain different state of calm and alert and an emotional regulation that the person feels. So then the, the person is able to, the mind is able to connect that that came from neurofeedback. 
But more importantly, the brain is like, whoa, whatever we did there, that felt really good. I've got a little seven-year-old that's coming right now. And he's like, he, he's like, mom, when do we go to Dr. K? When is our next appointment? Like he's asking his mom consistently, wanting to know when his next appointment is. So when I saw him yesterday, I said, I, I asked him, I said, great. So what is it like? What, what is it that makes you excited about coming in for neurofeedback? And, and, and he's like, well, I enjoy the movie. So he enjoys the movie, obviously, because with kids, we have the, the screen where they can watch movies. Mm -hmm. And then what happens with the feedback is if they're not in the ra range that I want their brain to be in, the screen becomes really small. And then, of course, the kid's going to work at making the screen big because they want to be able to see the whole movie. Right. So, so they do that. So, so, so what he said to me is, he's like, I said, so how do you feel when you leave? And he's like, much better. This is my little seven-year-old. Right. Says he feels better. Now he's not able to articulate what he's feeling better, but the fact that he gets so excited about coming in when he's never been excited about going for any of the behavioral therapies they've gone to, any of the talk stuff they've gone to, anything like that. Right. Looks forward to. Yeah. Right. So this calm, I, I wrote down the calm, the mm -hmm. alertness, and the emotional regulation and yeah. its impact in its impact on the brain. Mm -hmm. What is the consequence of that? What can your patients then, when they have the calm, the alert, and the emotional regulation, they feel better, and, and how is that better for them? Do they make better decisions in life? Is it, is it that their executive functions are functioning at a higher level so that when they're confronted with in a, you know, a, a, a stressful situation, anxiety such as a covid they're able to have that resilience. Is that, is that what you're talking That's about? That's exactly right. And, and you know, actually, Dan, we're the number one place where I always tell my patients that they'll start to notice a change is going to be in their sleep. So we know. Why is that? Why is that? Because, because typically a, an over, a trauma brain is an over aroused brain. Mm-hmm that brain is not going to be able to calm down and relax and have good sleep. Mm -hmm. When we don't have, you know, right now there's a phrase being used out there, corona somnia. That's, mm -hmm. People are using that because everybody's sleep got so disrupted. Right. So one of the classic signs of PTSD is disrupted sleep and dissociation, right? So you feel like you're kind of out of it. My patients will often say they feel like they're in a... a kind of surreal land, they have this brain fog and all of those kinds of things. So right. neurofeedback, first of all, because it calms the brain down, they begin to, my, my patients will start to sleep better. We all know that when we sleep better, the brain has this mechanism that's, um, you know, kind of like how we have the lymphatic nervous system that cleanses out our body. Right. The brain has a mechanism called the glymphatic nervous system, mm -hmm. G, lymphatic yes. nervous system mm -hmm. that cleanses the brain. So that means that all the stressful events we experience in a day create toxins in the brain. Right. There's also a link between people who don't sleep well and mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, right? We, we know that there's a link there. Right. Sleep is very restorative. Sleep is very cleansing and sleep mm -hmm. is very healing. Yes, it is. When we start to sleep better, neurofeedback, I always tell my patients, you know, yes, anxiety will go down, but what's going to happen is you're going to have some gnarly dreams. <laughs> like they don't right. remember their dreams. You'll have gnarly dreams because your brain is going to be cleansing itself more. And as a result of that, you'll start to feel better. You'll wake up in the morning more refreshed. You'll have energy in the day. And there's emotional immunity is really reduced emotional reactivity. Right. Right. So, so, so you're not reacting in a, in a like, negative way. No, yes. not negative way. You're not reacting, reacting in a hypervigilant way. You know, when you're understood. I understand. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. Right. I mean, one of the things I, I wrote down when you were talking, when you were talking about restorative sleep, and I think this is important because mm -hmm. for me being a, uh, um, you know, clinical nutritionist, one of the questions I ask them, not one of them, I, I always ask them, how is your sleep patterns? Are you being able to sleep? Do you have that deep restorative sleep? Because I want to know that because it's important because we have cortisol, 
that's yeah. running around in our in our system and and we want to look at that from a you know clinical nutritional aspect so you're looking at that from the neurofeedback and the nutritional aspect of it because we want to have seven to nine hours of sleep yes can you talk about sleep and how sleep deprivation would adversely affect the brain and that neuroplasticity that goes on so when we have sleep deprivation so bottom line is when we have sleep deprivation then the cleansing that the brain does the cleansing that the brain mm -hmm. does because uh, you know what happens is that cerebrospinal fluid when we sleep the during the times that we dream is when the neurons shrink right. and the cerebrospinal fluid flushes through the brain removes all the toxins and flushes it back out again so when we have poor quality sleep what's happening is our brain is not restoring itself the brain is not cleansing itself it's not rejuvenating itself it's not restore so think about our body if we keep like pushing our body and we keep not putting good nutrients into our body our body is going to respond in some ways with a lot more fatigue mm -hmm. we want to be able to have energy we want to be able to do the things we want to do we right. want to focus and a whole bunch of different things like that right so sleep right. in that sense deep quality sleep is one of the best gifts that we can give our brain it really is yeah Right. And, and it goes back to what you were saying before, because what I'm getting a sense of in your private practice is that you are treating your patients and you have multi modalities, neurofeedback, there's nutrition and there's lifestyle changes because a lot of in, in, in my world, you can see that chronic lifestyle diseases, yes. diabetes, Yes. Um, you know, di you know uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, you know, autoimmune types of conditions, obesity comes from a chronic lifestyle disease, whether it was from poor eating or as a uh, old football coach used to say to me, you know, when we were going through a tough time, you got stinking thinking going on in, in your in your head. We got to we got to change that to a more positive a more positive outlook. So you're attacking, you're attacking these conditions on many different fronts. Absolutely. And, and, and you tell me about your success rate in doing this. Wow. I, uh, the majority of the people who actually come to us come because they do not want to be on psychiatric medications for their And condition. that, and that was going to be our next part That's of our exactly. conversation. <laughs> And it's really fascinating to me because, you know, here, when I went for that postdoctoral degree in psychopharmacology, mm -hmm. I went to get that degree in order to actually become a medical psychologist who was going to write the prescriptions. Right. And then I made a complete U-turn. More, I was always in the integrative world, but I made a huge U-turn much more into the integrative world. So the success I see is people are not put on these medications. Mm -hmm with these horrible negative side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, my kiddos with ADHD especially, like, you know, we never medicated my son from mm -hmm. age, uh, you know, sixth grade on. Homework, oh my God, Dan, homework that was an hour and a half long, mm -hmm. could take us, as you, as you know, could take us four to five hours. To I was gonna say five hours. It could take you five oh, hours. Thing. And you know, and I'm I'm supposed to be a psychologist. I'm supposed to be like right. patient. And I don't want I'm losing my top and, and so does processing. So success rates are, you know, uh, kids start to do better in school. Adults who have had trauma mm -hmm. begin to actually feel for the first time that they're living life right. and that they can calm down that hypervigilance and they stop having flashbacks, they stop right. having dissociative episodes, they start sleeping better. So, you know, our practice is very successful because so many people, and I have, I have this one mom who just refers so many people to me. And every time she refers to me, it almost sounds like the people she's referring might need some talk therapy. And then as soon as I talk with them and I have a conversation with them, she makes it very clear to them. When you talk to Dr. Kakaya, say you don't want any talk therapy, you just want to do <laughs> <laughs> they're already telling me that they're not coming in for anything else other than the brain stuff that we're going right. to do. So, so it's really fabulous that we have 
a non-medication way right. to treat the brain. And in my world, like I, I go to conferences that are integrative medicine for mental health, mm -hmm. we regard depression, PTSD, uh, anxiety as inflammation in the brain. Yes. Yes, so that's you, that's you, you see you you see what I'm talking about. That's right? that's that's yeah. where that's where I'm I'm, I'm living. Uh, you know, I had the same. You know, you're talking about your U-turn, and it yeah. sounded as if the U-turn started with your son. Of you course. know, you know, it started with your son. It started with me. Uh, you talk about over medication, polypharmacy, and and all of that. It started with me. I'm 58. And when I was 37, I had a cardiac event. I had a heart attack. Ah. So now I'm on a, a lot of medications, Lipitor, Tricor. But I was looking at my diet and, and somebody thank, thankfully referred me to a nutritionist. And this is how I got involved in nutrition is because my diet, the standard American diet, was in a, it's a pro-inflammatory type oh. of a diet. Oh. And it it was it brought me to the point, and I, I did a podcast uh, not 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 so long ago with a friend of mine who's a PhD also, and he brought about the seven sins of of um, of inflammation and and how that comes about whether you're eating processed foods, fats, trans fats, loss of sleep, okay, being able you know not being able to deal with the stress. You know, and it's it's very important because in my practice, what we what we do is we do a lot of blood work where yes. we're looking for sources, Dr. K, of that inflammation. Yes. So we're looking at foods. We're looking at uh, we look at we have labs that we test 180 different foods. We want to know what foods you should be eating and what foods you should be avoiding because you can tell me that you're eating the Mediterranean diet. That could be one of the most wonderful diets that you can eat. However, there may be components, aspects of that diet that are not so good for your unique biochemistry. And what you're saying is that the inflammation in the brain has a lot to do with how you're looking at a patient and how you're treating the patient. Right. So I look at it from a different standpoint. We're both looking at it at the same standpoint, I think, all at the same time. And right. it's, it's interesting how this inflammation that we're finding out mm -hmm. is affecting us. Talk a little bit about the standard American diet, how it creates the inflammation, and, and, and what you do. Tell me a little bit about that. I think that's important. So, so, you know, when I'm, when, when we're looking at, you know, people's nutrition and we're looking at how they eat and everything, what I have found is that, um, the over, obviously the overprocessed foods, as we know, create a lot of inflammation in the whole body and they create mm -hmm. inflammation in the brain. Now, we, when, we, when I see teenagers who are coming to me for depression, one of the first things I'm going to ask the parents to actually do, and my pediatricians will do this too, is they'll test the cholesterol levels of those teenagers. Interesting. What we find is that kids who eat a lot of uh, junk food and a lot of processed foods are actually going to have low, extremely low cholesterol levels mm -hmm. for the teenagers. And then what, as soon as you put, and they're showing signs of depression, they're showing signs of suicidality. When their cholesterol levels get brought into more of your higher, because the brain is such a beautiful organ that needs mm -hmm. a lot of fat. Yes. And we don't give it the right kinds of fats because we're obsessed with, you know, low fat and blah, 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 and all of that. So we're right. not giving the appropriate amount of fat to the brain for the brain cells to work as a brain. Right appropriately as they as efficiently as it can so i think one of the other things that i really the reason i like having my patients be looking at how they're eating what they're eating uh and but also more importantly how that affects their brain when i talk about these brain conditions as inflammation in the brain a big thing dan that i'm doing is i am destigmatizing mental illness Yes. Right? I don't, I rarely talk about mental illness now 
I talk about brain health conditions. I think that's a very important piece we do because when people say, oh, I'm going to go see a psychologist, there's so much stigma around that. Right, but right. the brain is an organ just like any other brain. So if we're going to put this delicious right. food in our body, why are we not thinking about what does my brain like? What do I want to give my brain? That's good. So food for the brain. Who, you know, eating all colors of the rainbow. We talk about that a lot. Sure. And, and eating, you know, eating for the brain, eating food, because the brain is that machine like what, tw I think 20% 20, 20 of the nutrients we put into our body go directly to the brain. It's the most metabolically active organ of the body. Yes, it is. And I love that you talk about brain health mm. as opposed to. You know, I love that mental health. I love that. I really, I really love that because in growing up again in, in, in my neighborhood, you're going to go see a shrink. That was. <laughs> you're right? a wolf. If you do that, you're a wuss. You can't like pull your stuff together, you know? Right, right. You know, who, you know, what, what is that? What is that? And that, and there was a big stigmata to that. And, and, you know, uh, I love that you're calling it brain health. I love that you mentioned that healthy fats are really good for your brain. And a lot of people hear about fats and they say, oh, fats are bad, fats are bad. So you can talk about like an omega-3 fatty acid, you know, for a child, you know, DHA, EPA is, is very good. That's an omega-3 yes. fatty acid because the standard American diet is higher in the omega-6 fatty acids, which is a pro-inflammatory state you want to stay away from those corn oils cakes candies cookies so if you're depressed those are those are foods you don't want right. to eat at no. all so the ratio should be between omega 3s and omega 6s should be 1 to 1 2 to 1 it's reversed where omega 6s now are 15 to 20 to 1 omega yeah. omega 6s to omega 3 fatty acids Yes. And I always mention the study. There was a study that I read in November uh -huh. of last year. Um, it was in the Mayo Clinic proceedings where they were talking about Spain and how the children in Spain were getting away from that Mediterranean type of a diet and they were eating more of that processed diet, candies, cakes, sugars, you know, cookies, they were eating cold cuts, all of those processed foods, and it was affecting it was affecting their health, their physical health, their mental health. Depression was was increasing. The biomarkers for you know diabetes were increasing, and you know even that from that a prior study in America, where. 54%, I believe, of Americans are eating this processed types of foods. And 25% of those that, of the 54% that consume the most of this, they had the physical and, and mental conditions, their brain health, their physical health was not really the best and where, and where it should be. So, you know, it's interesting. And also when we think about, you know, the <laughs> you and I could have such a discussion about this sort of like the <laughs> industrial food production right and if we look at the way in which if you go into a neighborhood that has poverty that you're going to have more of that processed fast food available correct cheaper and we don't have enough markets in there in those communities we don't have enough farmers markets in those communities and then we turn around when we look at an event like covid that occurred and we see why is it that those communities where those processed foods that are so much cheaper which is why they are there mm -hmm. and that's the community that has been so impacted by covid as covid has come around yes so there, it is i think there's a movement that we need to be able to have to be able to bring these kinds of uh, farms and farms in these communities and growing your own vegetables and growing your own food and making your own chickens there and, and all of that, that I think brings the whole thing. <laughs> you, 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 you are hitting on, on a very important point and I don't know when it changed because in growing up where I grew up in, in Northern New Jersey, I grew up in a very immigrant Italian American community. Uh -huh. However, we had peddlers just like they had in the old country. Yeah. 
where they would bring fruits and vegetables okay. fresh. So they would come out and they would have, and they were speaking Italian and, and, and they were singing some type of song. And I remember my, my, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother going out and they were buying fresh, fresh. fruits and vegetables. When you mentioned chickens, fresh chickens, there was a store where a, a block away where fresh chickens were brought in. I don't know at one point in time it yeah. changed because when I was growing up, that was what we ate. As a matter of fact, we never had like this cupboard filled with boxes of food. Exactly. exactly. There was no boxes of foods, but somewhere in the 70s, it did become that, you know, mid late seventies where it did become that it, it, you know, you had the TV dinners and so forth and so on. Ugh, right. Wow. And, and before that, I remember in the early to mid seventies, you know, they had these peddlers and you were able to eat fresh food and they bought that, those fruits and vegetables daily. It wasn't something yes. where you bought a week, a week's worth of foods. Yes. It was done daily. I remember, Yes, yes. Again, my, 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 my great grandmother, my, 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 my grandmother and my mother going out. I remember my father saying to my, to my mom, Hey, Hey honey, you know, you know, I'll go out today. You know, what do you, you know, what are we going to get? We're going to get strawberries. We're going to get, yes. you know, these vegetables yes. and they were nutrient dense. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. There has to be such a movement we start to create and I love it. Especially here in San Diego, we have more more farmers markets. So we we have a lot of farmers markets. So we all go shopping, and you know we've got these boxes that get delivered to your home now. Fresh yes. fruits and vegetables you can get those from from local farmers in the area. So there's right. but we need to bring those privileges into our underserved communities. We really need to have a movement where we bring that because right. um, because you know. One of the things in COVID that was not talked enough, I, I, I mean, I try to post a lot about this, is, is that we, we need to be working on a daily basis to build our physical immunity because we know that the virus doesn't strike when your body is physically healthy and here are the things you do. So right. we, we need to really emphasize more that physical uh, immunity that we build in our body. And I think as you and I have talked about this emotional immunity, that's just as important. And there's just so much of, and I hope, I hope that this pause we have had, because this mm -hmm. was a pause mm -hmm. that perhaps when we return back again, I think part of that emotional immunity is going to be for us to make more mindful decisions about how we do life in general, because right. when this was going on, there were so many more parents and kids that were out riding their bikes and mm -hmm. families had a chance to engage with each other more. There was more movement. I know a lot of parents are going bananas and they can't wait for the organized sports to start again. And <laughs> the organized right. sports are also a way in which we're kind of farming our children over to like somebody else who's making them do whatever they're doing. Right. Yes, of course, it's what our kids love, but the, just the, you know, our next door neighbors over here, they'll be out every evening and they're throwing the ball back and forth to each other, which is just like such a beautiful father-son connection that I see out there. And it's lovely, you know? You know what? I, 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 I agree with you on that 100% because my, my wife, you know, in the beginning of this, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you know when are we going to get out? And I said, listen, why don't we just enjoy each other yeah. right now? And so even if we have a Friday and Saturday night where it's family movie night, or, you know, we're, we're going for a walk, yes. you know, you yes. know, and we're going to go for a family run, mm -hmm. you know, and, and next Saturday is family health and fitness day uh, in, 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 in America. So, you know, it's a great time to get the family and, and, and to go for a walk. Physical immunity, emotional immunity. I live in a rural type of a community, a half a block north of where I am. And I can look out my window right now and I can see there's a farm that sells fruits and vegetables. And we just, as a community, as a town, we just put together a farmer's market where everybody can come in no matter where they are. You can come into the Howell, New Jersey farmer's market and you can buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Yes. So 
Yes. I'm looking at our time. We're probably at about an hour and 15. I think we can go on for another two or three hours, Dr. K, to really be honest with you. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, you know, I, I have some notes here. You know, we talked about you coming into the world of uh, neurofeedback and, and you want to sell franchises. Tell me about that. Well, so you know what? I, I am livid at, at the damage caused by psychotropic medications on mm -hmm. the bodies. You know, we have so much diabetes that comes about, you know, metabolic syndromes that come about when people oh. have SSRIs. And then my patients will get on SSRIs because they're depressed and then they have no sexual appetite. And so the marriage falls apart because right. there's a huge part of your life that's impacted by that. So right. sure. I have, because of the success I have seen with neurofeedback in my practice, I decided that I want neurofeedback to become a household name in America and around the world because my franchises are available around the world as well. To, just like how yoga is a household name or Coke is a household name or right. Prozac is a household name. So I have invested quite a bit of time, like for about a year and a half, we've been getting all our systems set up because a lot of people get very overwhelmed and intimidated about the idea of starting this brain uh, training in their offices. And so what I've done as a franchise is I've created a product that would be very easy. Like the primary person who is in that business does not have to say, oh my gosh, does this mean I have to get retrained? No, I will teach you how to hire a person who will do the neurofeedback in your center. And so you're just adding that as an additional component to what you may be already doing. And, and I'm being very picky about who I'm going to be selling these franchises to because they, I want them to be board certified professionals. I don't want any kind of quackery associated with it. Right. It's a very complex, uh, right. uh, it's, it's a complicated treatment modality. And right. so when I work with the primary principal of an, of a an clinic or an agency or anything, mm -hmm. then as I train their people, I will be very much involved in, making sure that they're trained the right way, they're coached the right way, and that the main person running the clinic does not have to get all overwhelmed about the idea of incorporating a, a new right. modality. And I just think people will be like, once you bring neurofeedback on and you start to see the progress that I've seen, it's gonna be like fire. Right, the way right. so so what you're looking for is licensed healthcare professionals, reputable licensed healthcare professionals, not somebody that's off the street, Oh, I want to do neurofeedback no, today. No, 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 no. Right. They've got to have some background. Yes. They have to have some background. How would they contact you for that? So they can go to my website. What's your um, website? It's www.healthywithin, W-I-T-H-I-N, healthywithin.com. And on my website, you'll see a, a section there that says own an office. When you click on that, everything that's involved in the money and involved in it i'm very transparent on that mm -hmm. what's required you submit an information thing and then i have a partner that i work with and they work very closely with myself and that person i usually answer a lot of the clinical questions mm -hmm. and then carl my business partner will be the one who will handle they have 40 years of experience in franchising so i've done everything like i'm very uh, right. I'm ethical professional i've crossed all my t's dotted all my i's so that 100%. The states, yeah, the states are, no, I'm in compliance with everything we need right. to do. And, and for, for those of our, um, you know, listeners who are thinking about seeing you uh, professionally, they would go to healthywithin.com yes. also? Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and then contact us. There's a contact us site there. My email right. is on there. My phone number is on there. They can Why don't you share your phone number with all, with all of our listeners? It's 858 622 Zero two two one. Dr. K, thank you very much for being on. I love this. This was a favorite podcast, and I knew it was going to be when we first spoke because <laughs> we were just right. We were we were we yeah. were going back and forth. We had rapid ideas. We're yeah. at an hour and twenty minutes right now, but I'm going to guarantee that all of us. All of the listeners are going to stay because it is 
a phenomenal podcast. Dr. K, thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for listening in and make it a great day.